Amanda Kitts is mobbed by four and five year olds as she enters the classroom at the Kiddie Cottage Learning Centre near Knoxville, Tennessee. Hey kids, how are my babies today? she says, patting shoulders and ruffling hair. Slender and energetic, she has operated this daycare centre and two others for almost 20 years. She crouches down to talk to a small girl, putting her hands on her knees. The robot arm, several kids cry. You remember this, huh? says Kits, holding out her left arm. She turns her hand palm up. There is a soft whirring sound. If you weren't paying close attention, you'd miss it. She bends her elbow, accompanied by more whirring. Make it do something silly, one girl says. Silly? Remember how I can shake your hand? Kit says, extending her arm and rotating her wrist. A boy reaches out, hesitantly, to touch her fingers. What he brushes against is flesh-coloured plastic, fingers curved slightly inward. Underneath are three motors, a metal frame, and a network of sophisticated electronics. The assembly is topped by a white plastic cup midway up Kit's biceps, encircling a stump that is almost all that remains from the arm she lost in a car accident in 2006. Almost all, but not quite. Within her brain, below the level of consciousness, lives an intact image of that arm, a phantom. When Kitts thinks about flexing her elbow, the phantom moves. Impulses racing down from her brain are picked up by electrode sensors in the white cup and converted into signals that turn motors, and the artificial elbow bends. I don't really think about it. I just move it, says the 40-year-old, who uses both this standard model and a more experimental arm with even more control. After my accident, I felt lost, and I didn't understand why God would do such a terrible thing to me. These days, I'm just excited all the time, because they keep on improving the arm. One day I'll be able to feel things with it, and clap my hands together in time to the songs my kids are singing. Kits is living proof that, even though the flesh and bone may be damaged or gone, the nerves and parts of the brain that once controlled it live on. In many patients, they sit there waiting to communicate, dangling telephone wires severed from a handset. With microscopic electrodes and surgical wizardry, doctors have begun to connect these parts in other patients to devices such as cameras and microphones and motors. As a result, the blind can see, the deaf can hear, and Amanda Kitts can fold her shirts. Kitts is one of tomorrow's people, a group whose missing or ruined body parts are being replaced by devices embedded in their nervous systems that respond to commands from their brains. The machines they use are called neural prosthesis, or, as scientists have become more comfortable with a term made popular by science fiction writers, bionics. Eric Schrempf, who has been a quadriplegic since he shattered his neck during a swimming pool dive in 1992, now has an electronic device under his skin that lets him move his fingers to grip a fork. Joanne Lewis, a blind woman can see the shapes of trees with the help of a tiny camera that communicates with her optic nerve. And Tammy Kenny can speak to her 18-month-old son, Aidan, and he can reply, because the boy, born deaf, has 22 electrodes inside his ear that change sounds picked up by a microphone into signals his auditory nerve can understand. The work is extremely delicate, a series of trials filled with many errors. As scientists have learned that it's possible to link machine and mind, they have also learned how difficult it is to maintain that connection. If the cup atop Kit's arm shifts just slightly, for instance, she might not be able to close her fingers. Still, bionics represents a big leap forward, enabling researchers to give people back much more of what they've lost than was ever possible before. That's really what this work is about, restoration says Joseph Pancrazio, Programme Director for Neural Engineering at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. When a person with a spinal cord injury can be in a restaurant, feeding himself, and no one else notices, that is my definition of success. A history of body restoration attempts, in the form of man-made hands and legs and feet, lines the shelves at Robert Lipschutz's office at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. 
The basic technology of prosthetic arms hasn't changed much in the last hundred years, he says. Materials are different, so we use plastic instead of leather. But the basic idea has been the same. Hooks and hinges, moved by cables or motors, controlled by levers. A lot of amputees coming back from Iraq get devices like these. Here, try this on. Lipschutz drags the plastic shell off one of his shelves. It turns out to be a left shoulder and arm. The shoulder part is a kind of breastplate secured across the chest by a harness. The arm, hinged at the shoulder and elbow, ends in a metal pincer. To extend the arm, you twist your head to the left, press a lever with your chin, and use a little body English to swing the limb out. It is as awkward as it sounds, and heavy. After 20 minutes, your neck hurts from the odd posture and the effort of pressing the levers. Many amputees end up putting such arms aside. It's hard for me to give people these devices sometimes, Lipschutz says, because we just don't know if they will really help. What could help more, he and others at the Institute think, is the kind of prosthesis Amanda Kitts has volunteered to test. One controlled by the brain, not by body parts that normally have nothing to do with moving the hand. A technique called targeted muscle re uses nerves remaining after an amputation to control an artificial limb. It was first tried in a patient in 2002. Four years later, Tommy Kitts, Amanda's husband, read about it on the internet as his wife lay in a hospital bed after her accident. The truck that had crushed her car had also crushed her arm from just above the elbow down. I was angry, sad, depressed. I just couldn't accept it, she says. But what Tommy told her about the Chicago arm sounded hopeful. It seemed like the best option out there, a lot better than motors and switches, Tommy says. Amanda actually got excited about it. Soon they were on a plane to Illinois. Todd Kukin, a physician and biomedical engineer at the Institute, was the person responsible for what they had begun calling the bionic arm. He knew that nerves in amputee stumps could carry signals from the brain, and he knew that a computer in a prosthesis could direct electric motors to move the limb. The problem was making the connection. Nerves conduct electricity, but they can't be spliced together with a computer cable. Nerve fibres and metal wires don't get along well, and an open wound where a wire enters the body would be a dangerous avenue for infections. Kuken needed an amplifier to boost the signals from the nerves, avoiding the need for a direct splice. He found one in muscles. When muscles contract, they give off an electric burst strong enough to be detected by an electrode placed on the skin. He developed a technique to reroute severed nerves from their old damaged spots to other muscles that could give their signals the proper boost. In October 2006, Kukin set about rewiring Amanda Kitts. The first step was to salvage major nerves that once went all the way down her arm. These are the same nerves that work the arm and hand, but we had to create four different muscle areas to lead them to, Kukin says. The nerves started in Kit's brain, in the motor cortex, which holds a rough map of the body, but they stopped at the end of her stump, the disconnected telephone wires. In an intricate operation, a surgeon rerouted those nerves to different regions of Kit's upper arm muscles. For months, the nerves grew, millimetre by millimetre, moving deeper into their new homes. At three months, I started feeling little tingles and twitches, says Kitts. By four months, I could actually feel different parts of my hand when I touched my upper arm. I could touch in different places and feel different fingers. What she was feeling were parts of the phantom arm that were mapped into her brain, now reconnected to flesh. When Kitts thought about moving those phantom fingers, her real upper arm muscles contracted. A month later, she was fitted with her first bionic arm, which had electrodes in the cup around the stump to pick up the signals from the muscles. Now the challenge was to convert those signals into commands to move the elbow and hand. A storm of electrical noise was coming from the small region on Kit's arm. Somewhere in there was the signal that meant straighten the elbow or turn the wrist. 
a microprocessor housed in the prosthesis had to be programmed to fish out the right signal and send it to the right motor. Finding these signals has been possible because of Kit's phantom arm. In a lab at the Institute, Blair Locke, the research engineer, fine-tunes the programming. He has Kit's slide off the artificial arm so that he can cover her stump with electrodes. She stands in front of a large flat panel TV screen that displays a disembodied, flesh-coloured arm floating in blue space, a visualisation of her phantom. Locke's electrodes pick up commands from Kit's brain, radiating down to her stump, and the virtual arm moves. In a hushed voice, so as not to break her concentration, Locke asks Kit to turn her hand, palm in. On screen, the hand turns, palm in. Now extend your wrist, palm up, he says. The screen hand moves. Is that better than last time, she asks. Oh yeah, strong signals. Kits laughs. Now Locke asks her to line up her thumb alongside her fingers. The screen hand obliges. Kits opens her eyes wide. Wow, I didn't even know I could do that. Once the muscle signals associated with a particular movement are identified, the computer in the arm is programmed to look for them and respond by activating the correct motor.